This is Evening News for Monday, November 25, 2013. I'm Samuel Suknanan. Thanks for joining us. Making the headlines tonight. Two dead, three rescued in Upper Demerara boat collision. Rohi says gun laws to be reviewed. Ramatar wants more to be done to curb interpersonal violence. Kanji Basin lands allocated for TNT Agri project. No evidence against ranks in Port Kaituma gold heist. And miners decompose body discovered with feet bound. And now for the news in detail. The police are reporting that two boats collided in the vicinity of Morataro, Upper Demerara River, which resulted in the death of two people. The incident occurred at about 21 hours on Sunday evening. Dale Duggan, 28 years of Morataro Village, who was the captain of one of the boats, and his passenger, Williamson Felix, sustained injuries to which they succumbed. The police also reported that Telford Lim, 33 years, of Malali Upper Demerara River, and his two passengers, Michael Edwards of Endeavour, Lower Demerara River, and Travis Giles of Malali, were rescued. Lim is in police custody, assisting with the investigations. Home Affairs Minister Clement Rohe has called for the country's gun laws and process of licensing firearm holders to be reviewed as he voiced concern over several recent incidents which resulted in deaths of lawmen and ordinary citizens. Here are the details in this report. The Home Affairs Minister's call for the review of the gun laws came in light of the recent upsurge in gun-related crimes. Rohi was at the time addressing a forum on interpersonal violence being held at the International Conference Center. He said the country should reconsider whether citizens have a right to carry firearms. Everybody wants a gun. What the hell they want with this gun, I don't know. What I do know is that yesterday a man pulled a gun and a sleeping wife. People are behaving in this country as though this is the United States. We are under the Constitution. You have the right to bear arms. You don't. And I'm considering approaching the President to ask him to let us review these gun laws irrespective of what the hell Ranger might think. Let the Granger support it in Parliament or not, let us review these gun laws. The minister noted that the police should aggressively go after those who sell, buy and trade firearms. Meanwhile, Rohi urged the conference to focus intensely on the prevention of violence, noting that fighting violence is much broader than crime fighting. He pointed out that while the police want to eradicate this scourge from society, they cannot be everywhere to stop it from happening. How is the police? In the true sense of the police, as we understand the term police, to be in every home, to be at every doorstep, to be at every yard, to be at every room shop, to be at every place where people gather socially or otherwise, or even among themselves, where a man picks up a gun, shoots his sleeping wife, and then after shoots himself. Is the police expected to be in their bedroom? How is that to be prevented? The Home Affairs Minister disclosed that to assist the police in their quest to end violence, the force has employed some 500 neighborhood police to act as watchdogs for violence within their communities. He challenged those participating in the conference to channel all of their attention during the two days forum on prevention and protection against violence. He stated that education is a vital key to tackle violence and should be encouraged at every forum among persons of all ages. Meanwhile, Rohi said that his ministry should be involved in the firearm licenses renewal process in light of the recent upsurge in gun-related crimes. Home Affairs Ministry should have a say. In the same way it has a say, in conjunction with the board, the firearm licensing board, the Home Affairs Ministry should have a say on whether to renew or not to renew a firearm license. It should not be something automatic. Like a visa in the United States, because you got a five-way visa last year, because at the end of those five years, automatic, you get another five-way visa. You know, that is true, Mr. Consul General. There should be no automaticity attached to this. We have to begin taking strong measures because People with guns in their hands are taking strong measures and embarrassing this country. 
Meanwhile, President Donald Ramatar this morning called for more to be done to curb the prevalence of violence in Guyana as he expressed concerns over the impact that interpersonal violence is having on the socio-economic health of the economy. More in this report. President Donald Ramatar said that while there is no fixed approach to addressing the issue of interpersonal violence, he is counting on persons to work as a cohesive unit and come up with strategic plans to tackle the issue from a national standpoint. The president was at the time addressing a conference of the prevention of interpersonal violence held at the Ghana International Conference Center on Monday. He said that interpersonal violence is becoming a major economic burden and the lives of too many young people are being cut down by the census act of fellow citizens. Everyone has an interest in reducing violence in our country. It is therefore the responsibility of all sectors of our society and all stakeholders to take a stand against violence and to contribute towards ensuring public safety and security. In this context, it is vitally important for there to be a multi-sectorial and multi-stakeholder approach to this problem. Together, we must reject and condemn all forms of violence. Collectively, we must stand in solidarity with the victims of interpersonal violence. And, be un and united, we must work to fashion strategies to combat this threat. Ramatar said that interpersonal violence is a threat to all citizens and as such it is the responsibility of everyone to work as a cohesive unit to rid society of this scourge. Meanwhile, the representative of the IDB, Sophia McKinnon, said that the interpersonal violence not only affects people but also hurts a country's economy. If we all ask ourselves what are the consequences of interpersonal violence, the first thing that will come to our minds, of course, is suffering and trauma and sometimes last a lifetime to many of, uh, many of those having to go through this. But as a bank, I can tell you there are other effects also we don't in the bank. Interpersonal violence is expensive. It is expensive for the public sector, who bears most of the costs, the economic burden. So that is why also, not only on the human part, but also for the economic, it is very important to address interpersonal violence. Indeed, I'm not going to, I'm not going to burden you with all these numbers. I'm sure they're in reports somewhere else. But it slows economic growth and impedes on social development. The conference is being hosted by the Ministry of Home Affairs to examine and adopt current violence prevention methodologies, develop a national plan of action towards violence prevention, and establish a body to coordinate violence prevention efforts in Guyana. The Ghana government has made available lands in the Kanji Basin for farmers in Trinidad and Tobago to invest in large-scale agriculture projection, Devant Maharaj, TNT Food Production Minister, has said. According to a statement by the government information agency, GINA, Maharaj pointed out that there will be scientific and empirical data regarding the potential for farming in accordance with the Resettlement Policy Framework, RPF, before it is offered to investors. Only last Thursday, during a press conference, Maharaj told local media operators that a decision would be made within two weeks as to the locations that would be made available for this venture. Maharaj, who is on a visit to Ghana, said discussions with his local counterpart, Dr. Leslie Ramsamy, have been fruitful. He said the working meeting was to afford a CMND agreement between the two countries, which follows through on the Jack Dew initiative, proposed to CARICOM decades ago. Maharaj said that with the change of administration in the Twin Island Republic, agriculture is now considered an important sector. Despite the country receiving most of its revenue from the blooming oil sector, he said the Kamala Prasad Besessar administration has revisited its strategy, hence the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding with the government of Guyana. More of the evening news after these messages. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the evening news. The partially decomposed body of miner Andre Hercules, 40 years, was found with his feet and hands tied in a mining pit. The police say the discovery was made at about 8 hours 30 yesterday at Long Island, Middle Mazaruni. Investigations are in progress. 
Private Sector Commission Executive Member Jerry Govaya said Ghana is now in jeopardy due to the irresponsible behaviour displayed by the ruling People's Progressive Party Civic and the opposition at the level of the National Assembly during their deliberation on the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of Terrorism Amendment Bill. Details in the Svetlana Marshall report. Jerry Govaya, Executive Member of the Private Sector Commission PSC, expressed disappointment in the People's Progressive Party Civic, a partnership for national unity and the Alliance for Change as he pondered on the Caribbean Financial Task Force's recent move to blacklist Guyana for non-compliance security requirements. Without any sign of uncertainty, he lamented that all political parties are to be blamed. I am furious. I am extremely disappointed and upset with the Parliament. Um, that Parliament could have contributed um, to, this, to this mess, to this, to this negative effect on Guyana's image, to this negative effect on our economy. The anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism amendment bill was read in the National Assembly for the first time on April 22, 2013. It was subsequently read on May 7 when a decision was made to send the bill to a parliamentary special select committee. But from the onset, the AFC made its position clear that it would support the bill only if the Public Procurement Commission is operationalized. The tactics employed by the AFC was, however, denounced by Gavaya. I say don't bargain with things like this. Let us, you know, I, I, I understand politics and I understand, well, that there will be some bargaining and compromising and so on. But on issues like this where we have to meet international standards, we should not be playing games, political games, with the image and the economy of Guyana. This is not about the government of Guyana. He said too that APNU and the PPPC have also acted reckless in tackling the anti-money laundering bill as he expressed disappointment in the National Assembly. On November 7, APNU and AFC voted down the bill despite the government's attempt to comply with CFTF requirements. APNU had said that more work needed to be done on the bill, although it has not officially proposed any amendments. Gavai is now hoping that good sense will prevail before the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, meets in February 2014. CFATF will meet again in May 2014. Turning his attention to the Public Procurement Commission, the PSC executive member said the government must not underestimate the importance of the commission. The government as well need to be told to get off their tail and get the, 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 the procurement commission up, get the financial, the, um, the integrity commission, get the ombudsman. We need those things as well. Reporting for the evening news, I'm Swetlana Marshall. The Donald Ramatar administration will soon approach the main opposition parties to discuss the way forward in tackling the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism amendment bill to mitigate the impacts of being blacklisted by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF. More details by Svetlana Marshall. Legal Affairs Minister Anil Nanlal said the government, a partnership for national unity and the Alliance for Change, have to return to the negotiating table to discuss the way forward as it relates to the passage of the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism amendment bill. That is where the government, I suppose, and the opposition will have to sit down and see how they can sort out if there is an impasse. I am told that the a APNU um, has called for the bill to be retabled. Last week, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF, officially blacklisted Guyana after the National Assembly failed to pass the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism amendment bill in which CFATF recommendations have been incorporated. Nan Lal, speaking at Freedom House earlier today, said Guyana must move to pass the amended bill by February or May the latest, when CFATF is expected to host its next meeting. If the requisite amendments are not passed by the, in the National Assembly and other identified deficiencies not rectified on or before May of 2014, which is the next plenary meeting of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force has indicated that they will pass Guyana over to the Financial Action Task Force for an ICRG review to begin. 
in respect of the identified deficiencies. Now, when that process, if we are subjected to that process, that is a very long and protracted exercise that can take several years. And while that process is ongoing, Guyana remains blacklisted. Nevertheless, the Legal Affairs Minister said the government will not take the blame for Guyana being blacklisted. He said a trade-off agreement proposed by the AFC is simply unacceptable. AFC had said that it will only support the bill if the Public Procurement Commission is established. The fact that the AFC wants a procurement commission has nothing to do with this bill. Absolutely nothing. There is absolutely no connection directly or indirectly between a, a procurement commission and the bill which was rejected by the opposition. In November 2011, Guyana was among countries listed with strategic deficiencies in their anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism regime, resulting in the initiation of an action plan to address the problems. But after failing to meet several deadlines earlier this year, Guyana was still unable to comply with CFTF requirements by November 18, before the CFTF meeting on November 20. Due to Guyana's non-compliance, CFTF has advised its members to consider the implementation of countermeasures to protect their financial systems from the ongoing money laundering and terrorist financing risks emanating from Guyana. Reporting for the Evening News, I'm Swetlana Marshall. Today, the alleged murderer of Madia businessman, Vanderlia Keenan, appeared before Magistrate Judy Latchman in the Georgetown Magistrate's Courts. Robert Paul, 37, was not required to plead to the indictable charge, which stated that on November 20, at 111 miles Patara Madia, he murdered Keenan in the course of the furtherance of a robbery of the property totaled $17 million cash guy in a currency. Prosecutor Renetta Betham objected to bail, citing the seriousness and prevalence of the offense. Bail was refused and Paul was remanded to prison. The matter stands adjourned to tomorrow morning where it will be heard before Chief Magistrate Prius Uniran Bahari. The National Agriculture Research and Extension Institute, NARI, will be expanding its laboratory facilities with the recent approval of $35.2 million for this project. The details in this report. Agriculture Minister Dr. Leslie Ramasamy said that a multi-million dollar contract is part of a project aimed to enhance the laboratories at the National Agriculture Research and Extension Institute, NARI. This will help to advance the services offered by the Institute in research and development of agricultural crops. Some infrastructural work and modification need to be done. So the $35.2 million dollars is civil works, mainly electricity, and also some physical modification of the area to support the two labs, the biocontrol lab and also the tissue culture lab. Dr. Ramsamy said that the project will help to significantly enhance the outcomes of many agricultural projects being undertaken. Guyana is indeed privileged to have an agriculture sector that have such capacity. Most developing countries don't have that. And we send specimens abroad. While some countries use stem cells and tissue culture to start a new crop, they usually have to bring those in from another country. Um, but Guyana has that capacity um, and, and we need to upgrade uh, these facilities. The Institute facilitates the use of improved production technology by agricultural producers and establishes adequate feedback systems for them in order to achieve and maintain national self-sufficiency and export capacities in food. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknandan. 
The police today said that cognizant of media publications which gave the perception that three police ranks were implicated in the recent robbery committed on the Eldorado Trading Company at Port Kaituma. The Ghana Police Force wishes to clarify that investigations into the matter did not unearth any evidence against the ranks. Police said that while the ranks were placed under close arrest based on initial information received, they have since resumed duties. The Ghana Hindu Dharmic Sabha, which was recently renovated, was yesterday renamed after its late president Pandit Rupu Deman Pesod. Bishar Mohammed was there and filed this report. The new name was on Vilas Pandit Rupu Deman Pesod Dharmic Sanskrit Kendra since it was his vision to have a Hindu academy in Guyana that would provide training for Pandits and more so promote all forms of the culture and tradition of Hinduism. At the unveiling ceremony, President Donald Ramata reminisced on the struggles and contribution of the former parliamentarian and People's Progressive Party civic stalwart Ripudaman Prasad. And I think that this is indeed something extremely worthwhile because Pandit Ripudaman Prasad has given most of his life not only to promote Hinduism and to preserve the culture, the rich culture that his descendants brought from India, but he also dedicated himself to the betterment of all Guyanese. And he was able to build this organization in a very difficult time, at a time when courage and dedication was badly needed. It was just after the 1973 elections when our country was going through some of the most difficult political period in our history. The head of state described the late Pandit Prasad as a freedom fighter, noting that his idol was Indian freedom fighter Mahatma Gandhi. He followed in the footsteps of some other great who came before him. For instance, he linked religion and politics in a very, very fine way. The same way that Mahatma Gandhi linked religion and politics in the fight for freedom in India. Against this backdrop, he thought renaming the facility in honor of the late Prasad was indeed worthwhile. And his prestige and his strength and his personality grew in this organization largely because he identified the whole promotion of culture with the fight for the oppressed, with the fight for ordinary people, for freedom and for democracy. Prime Minister Samuel Hines congratulated the Sabah for renaming its headquarters and reminisced his time spent with the leader and charged the new executive to continue the work of Pandit Prasad. He was someone who I recall visiting members from the UK expre expressed great surprise to see someone who knew or in great detail all the rules and procedures in Parliament. I want to wish continued success to the Diana Hindu Dharmic Sabha under its new president and with its executive and keep on the good work and the tradition set by the late party to reboot the man inside. Immediately after the unveiling, the Sabha hosted its annual Kala Ustau, which featured more than 150 young people under the ages of 25 participating in friendly competitions. Bisha Mohammed, The Evening News. Join us after these messages for more news. Welcome back. You're watching the evening news. And now for a look at some more news. Attorney General Anil Dandalal today said that the local government amendment bill, which was not assented to by President Donald Ramatar, was unconstitutional. Here are the details. 
Legal Affairs Minister Anil Nanlal today have said the move by President Donald Ramatar to reject the local government amendment bill was just, positing that the bill was unconstitutional. The bill was sent to the Speaker of the National Assembly on November 14, after the President withheld his assent on October 28. Speaking at the PPP press conference today, Nanlal explained that the changes made to the bill by the Joint Parliamentary Opposition at the level of the Parliamentary Special Select Committee render it constitutionally and institutionally defective and deficient. Parliament shall establish a local government commission, the composition and rules of which empower the commission to deal as it deems fit with all matters related to the regulation and staffing of local government organs and with dispute resolutions within and between local government organs. In the Special Select Committee, the Joint Opposition made several changes to the bill whose cumulative effect were to confer upon the local government commission powers, duties and responsibilities beyond and in excess of those granted to the local government commission by Article 78A of the Constitution. He lamented that the changes were made by the Partnership for National Unity and the Alliance for Change, despite the People's Progressive Party signal its objection. According to Nan Lal, the opposition also deleted key clauses within the amendment. Many clauses which were contained in the bill originally tabled by the Honorable Minister of Local Government and Regional Development were deleted by the joint opposition in the special committee without any or any adequate insertions made to fill the void created by those deletions. In consequence, there are now several structural and institutional deficiencies in the functional architecture of the local government structure created by the said bill. The opposition had used its one-seat majority to decentralize financial and administrative powers from the local government and regional development minister and gave it to the local government commission under the local government amendment bill. Despite the non-assent of that one bill, the fiscal transfer bill, the municipal and district council's amendment bill and the local government commission bill have been enacted. Reporting for the evening news, I'm Swetlana Marshall. Manager of the Open Door Center, Arthur Lewis, said that the institution is beset with a number of issues that need serious attention if the objective of the school is to be carried out properly. Lewis, during a recent induction ceremony of a new executive management team, said that the institution is faced with an inadequate physical infrastructure, transportation, succession planning, and certification issues. Lewis noted that despite these issues are catered for in the institution's strategic plan 2013-2016, to they should be addressed at the soonest possible time. He added that as part of the plan, the organization hopes to undertake a review and design of the organizational management structure. Another key area that needs to be looked at is capacity building, with specific focus on regularizing the employment status of instructors from part-time to full-time. Additionally, Lewis said there is also a need for these instructors to be exposed to more training. Transportation, he said, is another issue which needs to be looked at with the aim of expanding this, especially since the institution institution deals with persons of varying disabilities. Footsteps has removed to expand its business and will be opening up a new branch tomorrow in the capital city. More in this story. Footsteps marketing manager Michael Allen said that the company decided to open a new branch to better cater for the needs of its customers, especially based on the success of the megastore located at Regent Street, Georgetown. Allen said the new location will offer the same products and services in a more spacious and comfortable atmosphere. According to him, business has been going very well for the company. The expansion like for, like for example, the megastore uh, and this particular one, these are long-term investments. These investments are, of course, we, it's just been a year since Footsteps Megastore has been opened. So the response that we've gotten has been overwhelming for us. Um, and that more or less is the catalyst for this particular investment. We have recognized and we're very thankful and grateful for the support that we've gotten from the Guyanese public. And we want to serve them better, especially in, around this time in this particular area. So that prompted this opening. He noted that a new store will be located between the corners of Kroll and Longdon Street, Georgetown, or in the building of what was previously referred to as Salt and Pepper Food Court. We haven't brought Home and Beyond here. We've brought uh, Footsteps Mega Store here. So this is clothing, 
accessories, footwear, or brands that everyone known to love are Ryder brands or Grenda brands or uh, Polo Berkshire brands. Those brands and the baby items, those two floors. So whatever you see at Footsteps Mega Store in the first two floors is what you'll see here. The store is being opened in time for the busy Christmas season from Tuesday, November 26 at 9 hours. The leased facility will be linked to an on-site food court which will be the home to a new franchise. The company's multi-million dollar mega store, located on Regent Street was officially opened October last year. The six-story, 58,300 square foot building houses a five-star restaurant, a shopping mall and a fast food service. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Sutnandan. Join us after these messages for more of the Evening News. Welcome back. You're watching the Evening News. An East Kanji woman lost her baby while giving birth at the New Amsterdam Hospital on Friday. She said she doesn't know what happened exactly, but was in a lot of pain. She remembered calling for help, but no one came to her rescue at the moment. She said that shortly before her delivery, she could not breathe. The Evening News understands that the infant was born with a heartbeat, but the unbiblical cord was wrapped around the neck, causing the child to suffocate. According to the 26-year-old housewife who was delivering her second child, when the midwife on duty realized that there were complications, she called for a doctor, but by the time the doctor arrived, it was too late. The two doctors, she says, arrived about 15 minutes later. The woman said that the doctors related that the baby died from strangulation. Kendall said that she is still waiting on a report from the doctor. The baby's father, Stefan Kendall, says they are not being told the truth. He says that he has been told two stories. An autopsy performed on the bodies of Ramdat Loknot, 80, 48 years, and his slain wife, Suramini Loknot, 42, who were found in the wee hours of Saturday morning at Camerville, proved that they died both from single gunshot wound to their heads. Bishar Mohammed reports. The post-mortem was performed by Dr. Neal Singh at the Georgian Public Hospital earlier today. The Evening News understands that a .9mm pistol might have been used to kill the woman, but then the businessman turned it on himself. It was also gathered that the businessman may have shot the woman while she was asleep since she was found lying on her bed with him and the murder weapon nearby. Speculation surfaced after the shooting incident, but based on reports, the couple was in the middle of a divorce settlement and the businessman had agreed on a financial settlement, but there was one major problem. He had reportedly agreed to pay the woman 50 million Guyana dollars, but he did not have the money, and instead he resorted to make an application for a loan at a city bank, but he was denied. He was contacted on Friday afternoon by the bank, and this spurred some frustration. The reason for the loan application was due to the fact that he did not want to sell his property, which he started from scratch. To date, family members remain tight-lipped about the issue, but reports reaching the newscast suggested that the couple share a rocky relationship, one that was filled with arguments. Days prior to the murder-suicide, the woman was asked to return home from Trinidad and Tobago by her husband, under the impression of a possible reconciliation. A close relative of the man explained that the businessman would constantly accuse the woman of being unfaithful, and vice versa. Bishan Mohammed, The Evening News. Windsor Estates, a multi-billion dollars housing scheme, was officially launched in Ghana on Saturday with Prime Minister Samuel Hines being the first to get a tour of one of the eight North Haven model houses. After touring the heritage, a luxurious 1,900-square-foot two-story three-bedroom house inclusive of a kitchen, dining room, living room, bathrooms and a garage, Prime Minister Hines expressed appreciation that the developer of Windsor Estates, Navigant Builders Inc., can meet the housing needs of the diaspora and even locals. Chief Executive Officer of Navigant Builders Inc., Danny Saw, a U.S.-based Guyanese entrepreneur, said Windsor Estates seeks to bring a new style of living to the Guyanese populace based on design developed in North America. During the construction process, keen attention will be given to details and quality. Additional persons who capitalize on the offer to be part of the Windsor Estate family will be given a five-year warranty on found the foundation and the exterior of the house, in addition to a 10-year warranty on the roof. 
Join us after these messages for your sport news. Welcome back. And now for a look at sport in your headlines. Guyana and Doug Gore take GMRC titles. Compton and Pelly record victory on opening night of GFF Bankspear Cup. Leon Johnson to lead Demerara in senior inter-county 40 cricket. Guyana came from behind to secure the 2013 Seaboard Marine-sponsored Caribbean Motor Racing Championship GMRC country title with while Jamaican Doug Gore took driver championship top honours after the championships concluded on Sunday with its final leg at the South Dakota race track. Raji Bisnot witnessed the action and has this report. scored a whopping 508 points to win the overall championships. The host fought back bravely in the CMRC events on Sunday with drivers Kevin Jeffrey and Mark Vera along with superbike riders Joel Neblet and Stephen Vera kept home pride alive by their dominance. Jeffrey dominated the first two CMRC Group 4 races to grab the checkered flag while his counterpart Mark Vera took pole position in the final race. Jeffrey was also leading race three for the first three laps, but suffered a mechanical problem which left his machine incapable of completing the race, allowing Vera to win it ease. The victory crowned a rewarding day for Vera, who had earlier chalked up a second and third in the first two races. <laughs> Jamaica's Doug Gore, who took a driver championship top honours with 118 points, finished third and second respectively in the first two races, while Mark Maloney and Peter Ray finished second and third respectively in the final CMRC Group 4 race. It must have been a disappointing day for Gore, whose Audi TT has been touted as the fastest car in the Caribbean at the moment. Meanwhile, in the Superbike category, it was all Guyana, as Neblet and Vera grabbed the checkered flag in the three races. Meanwhile, Jamaica finished second on 392 points, followed by Barbados with 343 points. West Indies A-team batsman Leon Johnson has been appointed captain of the Demerara team for the upcoming Guyana Cricket Board's Senior 4-Day Intercounty Championships. Johnson, the left-handed middle-order batsman, will have dashing West Indies T20 all-rounder Christopher Barnwell as his deputy. The 14-man squad, which includes discarded West Indies batsman Ramnaresh Sarwan, was selected following a rain-interrupted three-day trial gone last week. The squad reads Leon Johnson captain Christopher Barnwell, Vice Captain Ramnari Sarwan, Trevon Griffith, Rajendra Chandrika, Chris Patadin, Derwin Christian, Stephen Jacobs, Amir Khan, Totoram Bishun, Trevon Garraway, Randy Knights, Zabir Mohammed, and Paul Wins. The Demara Cricket Board, in a press release, stated that promising opener Tejan Ryan Chander Paul was not considered for selection as he would be on duty with the West Indies Under 19 team in Bangladesh. The tournament bowls off on Thursday. North Georgetown are the champions of the 53rd edition of the National Schools Athletics, Swimming, Cycling and Teachers Championships and assistant manager of the team is proud of the win. Tristan Joseph reports. After becoming the most successful district with 14 titles, North Georgetown's assistant manager, Marisco Williams, was overwhelmed by the win when the event concluded on Friday evening at the Guyana National Stadium, Providence. At this moment, I'm very excited. 
it is a, a great boost for us because we everybody would have been bragging and boasting, but then again, at the end of it, we won the bragging rights. So we're very excited about this win. Williams also pinpointed the team's weaknesses while congratulating her team. Track and field, we perform excellent, I should say. I want to commend our, commend our teachers for going out there and giving us this championship back. As thumbs up to them. If it was not for them, we would not have retained this championship. And the cyclists also. Meanwhile, a three-peat is definitely on the cards for the back-to-back -back champions, according to Williams. Definitely, because next year, trust me, the teachers' championship will be even more stronger than this year. So we know our weakness, we come in and we're going to have it three straight in a row. North Georgetown won the championships with 65 points to outlast Upper Demerara Kokwani by three points for their 14th title. Remember, you can read about these and other stories in tomorrow's edition of the Ghana Times newspaper, which can be purchased from vendors across the country. When you're not reading our newspaper or watching TVG Channel 28, do remember to tune in to RGI on 89.3, 89.5 or 89.7 FM. Your Bridge Reports are next. Welcome back and now for a look at your bridge reports. The Demo Harbour Bridge will be closed on Tuesday, November 26 at 11 hours 30 for a period of one and a half hours. And the Burbies River Bridge will be closed on Tuesday, November 26 at 11 hours for a period of one and a half hours. That's your Monday, November 25, 2013 edition of the Evening News. I'm Samuel Signandon. Thanks for joining us.